You are about to listen to a message by Apostle Joseph Minter. Apostle Joseph Minter is the head pastor and leader of Torch World Ministries, an all-encompassing network of ministries. Through his teachings of the Word, healing, deliverance and declarations, the power of God has transformed many lives. Now the Word of God. With Jacob at God's Quarry Site, Part 2. And Jacob's school started when he left his father's house. His two started. Then God put up the light. And let me tell you, I've told you this. Let me repeat. God is not a lazy fair parent who easily yield because you cry or because you threw tantrums. No, he did not spare his son. Why his son was on the cross? Do you know that Jesus tried to convince the father? He said, Abba Father. Abba Father means dear daddy. All things are possible, dear daddy. Look at your child saying, dear daddy, in distress. God remove his eyes, allowed him to go through. <laughs> because God was thinking beyond his suffering. There was glory ahead of his suffering. And in the Bible, there is no glory without suffering. First Peter 1 11, the suffering of the Christ and the glory that should feel. No suffering, no glory. Father, we thank you this morning. We give you praise. Thank you for this opportunity. We commit ourselves to your hand. I pray that you help me speak spiritual truth with spiritual words. And I pray for all those who hear me. That you help them also to understand and help all of us to be edified. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for today. Um, today is 10th September 2022. And today is 11th. Okay, yes. 11th September 2022. 9-11. Exactly 21 years now. Okay, we thank God. Today I'm, I'm, I'm talking about with Jacob at God's quarry site. And today is part two and the concluding part. Last week I started um, talking about Jacob. And uh, we got to a point and I said today we're going to go uh, back on that. Jacob, the, the son of Isaac. Now, there are, there, are, there are some people that God has made prophetic templates in the Bible as far as his ways and his dealings with mankind is concerned. And so we, we saw from Isaiah 51 where, where God said, look to Abraham, your father, and look to Sarah, your mother. So there's, there's a place for that in scripture. And uh, all those people who work with God, especially the patriarchs, uh, their lives were not their own. God, their, their lives were used up by God. Because God was constituting them into a template for future generations to be able to follow the, the, the trail of their movement uh, in, 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 in dealing with God. So we saw what Abraham stands for, what Isaac stands for. Uh, and what Jacob stands for. And we saw that Jacob, uh, in many ways, represents um, the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Abraham uh, gives us a picture of the fatherhood of God, of the Father. Then Isaac gives us a picture of Christ, the Son. Then Jacob gives a picture of the Holy Spirit and how he transforms the believer. Then we also saw from 1 Corinthians 3 that uh, three precious stones or three kinds of materials are used in building on the foundation of Christ. We saw uh, on the good side, we have three materials, gold, silver, and precious stones. On the negative side, we have wood, hay, and stubble. But uh, talking about the, the positive side, gold, represents the nature of God because of the way gold cannot be corrupted. Gold stands for divinity. Then silver 
stands for redemption. So we saw how Jesus was bought or sold for 30 pieces of silver and how Joseph was sold for 30 pieces of silver. So silver stands for redemption. Redemption means to buy back. There's an element of business transaction, you know, in redemption. Then the precious stones also stand for the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. Precious stones are not just, you can't, you don't just stumble upon precious stones. Some of them, they are formed, they, they go through a process, you know, under the earth's surface, they go through a process of heat and many other intense pressures that are applied to the precious stone. If you check how pearls are formed, you understand that uh, it's not, there's a, it's a long process, you know, but at the end, then it comes out as a pearl. Now, in our work with God, that is what the work that the Holy Spirit does can be compared to the work of shaping precious stones, applying many things both internally and externally to the stones for it to be transformed into a particular shape so that the stone can be, I mean, it can fit into a particular slot that has been allocated for it. Let's open our Bibles to Isaiah 43 verse 1 and look at something about Jacob that we are looking at, the man we are looking at today. But now, that says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. Now, it says, the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel. One thing that we must understand is that the Bible is, nothing in the Bible is for decoration. Everything in the Bible is so and point, so prophetic. Now, it is not a coincidence that he was referring to Jacob as the created one and Israel as the formed one. Because the two are different. One was created and one was formed. Now, formation goes through a process. Creation is instant. When we become born again, our creation is instant. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. That is instant. That is when your spirit man is instantly created. But that is not God's ultimate end. God's ultimate end is formation. Formation that will be conformed to the image of his Christ. The reason why he foreknew us and that he predestined us was so that we could be conformed to the image of his Christ, of, of his son, Christ. So Romans 8.29 talks about that. Romans 8.29 says that um, uh, he foreknew us and um, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That is, that is God's, plan, God's plan for our lives. So even though we are created anew upon the new birth, Christ must be formed in us. Galatians 4.19, my little children in whom I travel again in birth till Christ is formed in you. So the formation of Christ in us, that is the real job of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit plays two roles. That he has a dual role. He is the one who got us born again, you know, together with the Word. According to Titus 3, 5, we were born again through the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then also born again through the incorruptible seed. Even the word of God who lives and abides forever. That's 1 Peter 1 23. Now, after that, the next activity is for the Holy Spirit to take us on a journey to practically conform to the image of Christ. And that, that is what we see in the life of Jacob. He was born as Jacob, but he, he was formed into Israel. And you know, he was not named Israel until, not until, I mean, uh, he had gone through a process, a process of of transformation. And so the name Israel was given to him as a culmination of the, of the dealings of God in his life. When God had dealt with him for, for some time and he was graduating from God's school, then he was awarded the name Israel. That's why he said, Jacob I created and Israel whom I formed. So it means that before we can be useful to God, we must be formed. It is not the created man that is useful to God. It's a formed man. 
The created man does not benefit God, but the formed man benefits God. Your salvation does not benefit God. Your salvation benefits you. By your dominion, benefits God. Because we were created to have dominion. You know, so when you read the Bible, you will see that God, God, even God blessed Adam and God created Adam, blessed Adam in Genesis 1, 28, you know. But then look at Genesis 2, 8 and see that it was not the created man that God put in a field. It was a formed man. The man that he had formed. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. Not the man that he had created. The two are different. So your creation or that God created you, gave you the new birth, does not really benefit God. It is only when Christ is formed in you because that is when you can be a vessel that allows heaven's policies to be implemented on earth. God's, God's supreme desire is to get earth to be like heaven, that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he does that through human functionaries and agent, agents. But these agents, he has to work on them so that they can get to a point where they can give him greater expression. Because when we come to the Lord, the Lord work that God must do, must do on us. Okay, now so we see Isaac's life typifies Christ who received all things from the Father. You see, Isaac was like Christ. Isaac never had issues in his life. Isaac never had issues. You know, his life was so straightforward because he was, he was representing the son. He never had to work for anything. He inherited what Abraham, his father, gave him. So you see that most of the things Isaac did, they were things Abraham left him you know and that is a picture of christ re-inheriting everything from his father as man i said jesus became man to re-inherit what he had already so that man could be in line for the inheritance so in isaac's life in genesis 25 um verse 5 you see and abraham gave all that he had to isaac then then yeah, then compare it with Matthew eleven twenty seven, Matthew eleven twenty seven. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. So I, that is Isaac and and Christ. There's a parallel. They are they are just Isaac is just a picture, or it was just a. a, a a prefigure, you know, of Christ. Now, Jacob, Jacob's life typifies the believer who also inherits things from Christ, but who practically must go through a journey of possessing them. Because Jacob also inherited things from his father Isaac, but he didn't have things smooth as his father Isaac, because he had to practically manifest the things that he inherited. And there was a lot of struggle in his life because there were many things that were preventing the blessing of God from manifesting in Jacob's life. Many, many things. Some of them he didn't even know, but God in his mercy brought them out, dealt with those things, and then Jacob was finally able to become the product that God was looking for. Because Jacob was one of the greatest men in the Old Testament. One of the greatest if you look at the story of Jacob and look at the stature of Jacob in the spirit, you will see that he was one of the greatest in the Old Testament. You know, and so um, his life typifies that. Now, Genesis 25, verse 19 to 28, we are going to read some scriptures, you know, long, long scriptures. Okay, so Genesis 25, 19 to 28. This is the genealogy of Isaac. Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Hmm. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together with her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. 
That's a spiritual person. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out and his hand took hold of, his, of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them, which Rebecca was burying for 20 years. And the Bible will say that Isaac would go to a place called Beer Laharoi, the Lord who sees. And he will, he will go there to pray for his wife. And it took him 20 years for Rebecca to give birth. Because, you know, you see Jacob, you see 20 years, 20 years in Jacob's life. Now, uh, so the boys grew and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. <laughs> okay. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Let me add, because of revelation. So Isaac's love was based on mundane things. The game, the, the, well, he was a hunter, he would bring the animals, you know, and then he would eat. That's why he loved Esau. But Rebecca loved Jacob because she heard from God. And God said, the younger will be greater than the older. Now, Jacob's election was by grace. Right from the womb, right from the womb, everything that Jacob, go to Romans 9 verse 10 to 13. He was chosen by God. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, <laughs> even by our father Isaac, for the children, not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. 13. As it is written, Jacob have loved, but Esau I have hated. It's a very strong word. Esau I have hated. Not, not Esau I don't like, I have hated. And this one, he said it was according to election, not of works. So be before they even came out of the womb, God had his choice. Now, you would think that God is unfair you see, God never disclosed to us his reason for hating Esau and his reason for loving Jacob. But subsequent events in their lives will let you know that God knew what he was doing. That Esau could never become the progenitor. There, 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 was, there was already a curse on firstborns. You know, all the firstborns in the Bible, they never had it. They never made it. Oh, yes. Cain never made it. Ishmael never made it. Esau never made it. Reuben never made it. All the firstborns, it was only Jesus. You know, Jesus Christ came as a firstborn to correct that case on firstborn. So he opened the womb and he made it. And so firstborns have been delivered from that case through Jesus Christ. That's why we, we, are, we, we are the church of the firstborn. We belong to the firstborn. And all of us are firstborns. And God doesn't have secondborns or thirdborns. Every, 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 every child of God, you are born as a firstborn. So the firstborn, the corporate man, the, the, the parting man, parting son, firstborn, Jesus Christ, and the corporate son, firstborn, the church. Now, so you will see that even in the womb, Jacob's nature was evident. They were fighting in the womb. And this one is not the usual kicking that women feel when they are pregnant. This one was unusual. That's why Rebecca was, was concerned. Because they were really fighting. And even to show you that they were fighting, when Esau was coming, Jacob said, where are you going? And then he held the heel. Like if you are finding somebody, he said, where do you think you are going? Then he held the heel like that. I won't let you go. It was a struggle. So there are some hatred there from the womb. It could be true. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> okay. Now, when he came out, then they called him supplanter. 
supplanter, somebody who holds somebody's heels. It's like somebody is walking, then you are holding his heel, making him fall. You see? So he was also called a deceiver. Deception was, was in his life. Look at a man like Jacob. You would think that such a person will have nothing to do with God's purposes. That's why he stands for God's transforming work. How God can take somebody and transform the person into a useful tool for himself. And you would have, you would say God is biased. No, but if you look at their lives, you will see. You will see Rebecca was a very spiritual woman. She went to inquire. She went to inquire. And because of that, her love for Jacob was based on revelation. She could have prophesied easily. Because God said, the younger shall serve the older. And, and nobody understood why it was like that. But let's continue. Genesis 28. So we are, we, are, we are looking at Jacob's life. And we are learning lessons from Jacob's life. So 28 verse, oh 25, sorry, verse, verse 29. 25 verse 29. We are just continuing from where. Now Jacob cooked a stew. As a matter of fact, it was being stew, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was being stew. Ah, <laughs> we are in good company. <laughs> and Esau came from the field and he was weary, tired, hungry, famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same rest you, for I am weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom, Red. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look. I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Was he about to die? Then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. The guy knew what he was doing. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Maybe he saw, thought, oh, I'm just joking. Oh, it's just a joke. I mean, I, I mean, afterwards, I'll just go and claim my birthright. He didn't know that God was interested in that transaction. Because it was just divine destiny unfolding. So, Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. And he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So Esau did not value the birthright. He didn't understand, he didn't know what it meant. The birthright had three, three main things. Three powerful things in the birthright. The first one was the double portion. Second one was the progenitor status. That you will be the one through whom the Messiah will come. So it would have been God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. Not of Jacob. And the third one was the patriarchal blessing. The blessing of the father. This, this, these three things constitute the, birth, the birthright. So it was not a light thing that Esau was just trading off like that. It was serious. And Jacob was smart. I believe that. I believe Rebecca, some way, somehow, the Bible doesn't say, but I believe that Rebecca, some way, somehow, found a way to tell Jacob that when I was pregnant with you two, God told me you will be the firstborn or you will be the one to carry the birthright. And that, that, that was the one, that was what was in Jacob's mind. So a little give me food. He wanted to be transactional. Sell me your birthright. Swear that I'm the firstborn now. You know, just over food. And Esau, you, you can't blame Esau too much because we all do that. So when you are hungry, uh, but the thing is that uh, Esau shouldn't have joked with something as precious as a birthright. But divine destiny was really at work. Really at work. So Jacob deceived Esau into selling his birthright to him for a pot of stew. Now, the Bible describes Esau as a vain person. In Hebrews 12, verse, verse 16, the Bible talks about Esau. He said, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Now, this is what happens to you when you fornicate. That is, you, you are selling something for something. You know, he said for one morsel of food, one morsel of food means just uh, some something little, little that you you will just munch. You know, then he sold his birthright. Jacob was a shrewd man, and he knew exactly what he was doing, and heaven also endorsed it. 
Now, you see, when Isaac was, was old and about to die, then the, uh, chapter 27, Isaac called J uh, Esau, his firstborn, and said, go and uh, give me, uh, prepare uh, venison for me. We are now in chapter 27. Okay, verse 1 to 46. It's, it's too long. We can't read, but then uh, we all know the story. So, okay. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes could not see, were dim and that he could not see, that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son. And he answered him, Here I am. Then he said he should go. Um, uh, you know, he doesn't know when he's going to die. He should go and prepare venison. Go to the forest, to the field, and hunt for game. Come and prepare meat, you know, food for him to eat so that he will bless him. You will notice the difference between Isaac and Jacob in their old age. Isaac's eyes were dim. He could still bless Jacob anyway, but he was deceived. But Jacob's eyes were dim, and he was able to guide his hand wittingly to Ephraim and then to Manasseh. Even though his eyes were dim, his spiritual sense was so alert. But Isaac, his eyes were dim, and his spiritual senses too were not were, were dull. Now, that is not in respect to his, his representing Christ. That one is talk, just talking about Isaac himself. I know Melky has a question on that. <laughs> now, you, you see that after Isaac called Esau, and then he, Rebecca was listening, and Rebecca tried to bring to pass what God had already said. The, you see an element of I will in Rebecca's attitude. God didn't need help for Jacob to be the firstborn. He had already said it. What Rebecca did was deception. It was not good. But it played into God's purpose. But it was just an element of I will. And that was what set the tone for Jacob's life. Jacob always thought that he had to get things by scheming and by fighting. He was a hard man. I have to get things by fighting, by scheming, by planning, by strategizing. You know, I have to be wild. I have to be fast. I have to be smart. That was Jacob. Very hard man. He was strong in the natural. Now, for God to be able to get such a person into a very, you know, uh, a mature person, that he can, he, he can be the Jacob that he is right now, God had to take him through a lot of process. A lot of things. Just to break that I will, I am, I can. These three things, these are the three things that prevent us, that will prevent us from seeing the glory of God in our lives. And God in his mercy will take us through process that will deal with these three things. I am, I will, I can. So you get to a point where you will say, I am what I am because of him. I can only do things he strengthens me. I will because he wills. Not my will, but yours be done. So you can get to that point. God cannot be comfortable to release his policies through you in your destiny. So that was the work that Jacob, that God was doing in Jacob's life. You know, and after taking the birthright, Esau was so naive to think that the blessing was still intact. No, when you give the best right, you give away the blessing. The best right contains three things. Number one, double portion. Double portion simply means that of all your brothers, you have extra portion. If you are 12, there should be 13 portions. Uh, two for the firstborn, then all the others will receive, you know. So the double portion status was, was, was given to Jacob. And, and number two, the progenitor status. Now the line was going to be through Jacob. And number three, the blessing. So you have, if you have sold the best, right? You have sold these three things. So it was naive for Esau to think that, no, my father, have you not reserved even one blessing for me? Isaac blessed Esau. And even the blessing he gave Esau was enough to sustain Esau. When he met Jacob, he said, my brother, I have enough. Take, take, take your gifts. I have enough. But Esau was blessed with the cramps. Not the main thing. And, and Isaac said, you will have to live by your sword. And the time will come, if you become restless, then you will break off your brother's dominion, off your neck. 
So you will live by your sword. You, you will prosper, but you, it will be by dint of fights and struggles and hard work. You know, because there's no, there's no favor on your head. You have to live by your sword. But Jacob was blessed with favor. Blessed with favor. Now, so Jacob was a very smart man at that point where he succeeded in taking the father's blessing. And you see, the thing is that Isaac, Isaac should have, I mean, but you see, any, these things, Isaac, there's so many ways Isaac could have found out that it wasn't Jacob. It wasn't Esau. The voice was Jacob's voice, but he said the hair. Because Rebecca too is smart. Number one, she knows what her husband likes. You know, she was, she was able to use a uh, goat to prepare the same meal that Esau would have prepared with the game, the, the, uh, the animal from, 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 from a hunting, hunting expedition. Mm. Uh, it, number two, he also clothed Jacob with sk the skin of an animal so that Esau, uh, Isaac would think it was Jacob because Isaac said, come, let me feel you. And when he came, you know, he said, let me smell you. So he even used his nose. He took Esau's garment. Don't joke with Rebecca. <laughs> you he said, and make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Okay, so let's continue. Let's continue. Let's continue from there. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt the game and to bring it. He was so happy. At long last, I'm going to, I'm going to get the blessing. So Rebecca spoke to Jacob and said, Indeed, I had your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game that I may make several food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. So the Lord was standing there waiting. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me, bring me from there two choice cakes of the goods, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat, that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, my, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a smooth-skinned man. One was like a bottle, no hair. One was like a chimpanzee, you know, full of hair. <laughs> Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him. And I shall bring a curse on myself, and not a blessing. He was afraid. But his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice, and go get them for me. You know, she thought she had revelation, but she didn't know that, you see, um, where the I will factor comes in is when we try to bring to an end what God only began. When we try to accomplish God's things through our own means. That is what religion will let you do. Okay, so continue. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother and he made savory food such as his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice cloak of her other son Esau which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. So the, everything was set. Now Isaac, you know, and she had, and she put skins of the kids of the goods on, the, on, the, on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave several food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of Jacob, her son. So he went to his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am. Here I am. Who are you, my son? <laughs> Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. You see, Isaac was not so sensitive because God could have told Isaac straight away, no, bless Jacob instead of Esau. But he was following food. Yes, he loved Esau because of the food. Venison, the seed. Yes. You know, sometimes you can make a mistake when all you are taking is seeds. So there are some, there are some people who, who will get some hands to 
come on their heads because of venison. But if heaven has not arranged it, nothing will happen. Okay. But Isaac said to him, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord your God brought it to me. I said, he said, Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son, Esau, or not. The man was suspecting something. So Jacob went near Isaac, his father. He felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. <laughs> And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hand, so he blessed him. And he said, are you really my son Esau? <laughs> he said, I am. He said, I am, I am factor. Then he said, bring him near to me and I will eat of my son's game so that my soul may bless you. Isaac wanted to use one more thing to really determine whether it was his son, his smell. So he brought it near to him and he ate and brought it him wine and he drank. Then his father Isaac said to him, Come near now, my son, and kiss me. He, he, he has lost his sight, so he had to use some of his dominant senses. Then his father, oh, and he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field. Who the Lord has blessed. And he did not know that he blessed Jacob instead of Isaac. But the blessing stood because of the anointing that was on, on Isaac. He had power to transfer the baton from Abraham to the next one who will be the progenitor. And he gave it to Jacob. When Esau came, fast forward to when Esau came, he said, I have blessed him and there's nothing I can do. He shall be blessed indeed. Because the patriarchal blessing had to come from Isaac. And he gave it to Jacob. Now all this while, Jacob didn't have a knowledge of God. He didn't know God. He only knew the God of his father. He had not become his God. You see, But you see, heaven's agenda was still rolling out. So heaven will make sure that this guy will be given an encounter that will bring him home. Because he had been divinely selected and appointed by election of grace to be the firstborn. And if you realize, getting to the end of his life, the only blessing Jacob had was to reverse firstborn and make the secondborns. <laughs> he didn't get it. Okay. Now we go to Genesis 28. Mm -hmm. Genesis 28. Then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father, and take yourself a wife from there of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you. He was blessing him again. And make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be an assembly of peoples and give you the blessing of Abraham. He was the only person in the Bible that he was giving the blessing of Abraham specifically. The, the blessing, not blessing, the, the blessing to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you were a stranger which God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Padan Aram to Laban, the son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Look at Esau. Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take himself a wife from there. And that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, you shall not take a wife from the daughter of Canaan. And that Jacob had obeyed his father and mother and had gone to Padan Aram. Also, Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan did not please his father Isaac. So Esau went to Ishmael 
took Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, sister of Nebajot, to be his wife in addition to the wives he had. After Jacob left his father's house, you know, when he left, he was not a spiritual person. No, he was not. He didn't really think about spiritual things. He was natural, a natural man who had strength. He relied on his strength, his ability to, to scheme and to bargain, negotiate, you know, fight through life. That was Jacob's life. He, he was a very daring person, very bold, very strong, you know. But he was just pursuing life without God's perspective, you know. And so when he got, as he was traveling, he went from Beersheba and went toward Haran. Then he got to a certain place. I'm reading, got to a certain place uh, <laughs> and stayed there all night because the sun had set. The sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. The sun had set. It was evening time. I've thought about this before. I said, God starts his work on us always in the evening. We count days from morning to evening. Is that not it? God count days from evening to morning. When you go to Genesis 1, when you go to Genesis 1, you will see, and the evening and the morning was the first day. And the evening and the morning, second day. God called the light day, and in the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. It happened throughout Genesis 1. God never called the day from the morning. God's day always starts from the evening. That is why when God calls you and God brings you to school, you will start from the night. Night classes. As soon as you call Jacob, you put out the light. He said, school time. You have been your own man for a long time. You have been so strong and you have relied on your strength heavily. But that texture of character cannot be used. I can't use you like that. I must shape you, cut you to size, transform you, break you, mold you, wash you, burn away your chaff. And I only do that when I put up the light. So that was why when Jacob got there, he said the sun has set. That was the beginning of God's school. It was at that sunset that he had the first encounter of God. And I said, the first thing that God gives you, he'll give you encounters. So, Jacob got to the place, back to Genesis 28 verse 10, and then he took um, a stone, and then he slept on the stone. Now, that stone might have be, been part of Abraham's original altar, we don't know. But that place was the place Abraham built an altar, first time in Bethel. You know, and that stone that he slept on, he started having dreams and an encounter. Then he saw a ladder from earth to heaven and God on top of the ladder and angels ascending and descending. And God appeared to him and God said, I am the Lord God of your fathers, your father Abraham and your father Isaac. The land that you are lying on, I will give to you and your descendant, I will. Also, your descendants shall be as that of that. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That was God's promise. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Such a glorious encounter. When Jacob came back from that encounter, Jacob said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. He didn't have any prophetic antenna. No, no nothing. He didn't, it, there was not, no relationship between him and God. He only knew the God of his father, Isaac. He didn't know him as God 
of me, myself, my God. So, after we encounter destiny, we encounter God and become aware, aware of him, of his purposes, God puts us on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. That path of righteousness, it is not for your sake, it is for his name's sake. Now, he takes you to school. And right when he was about to start school, the son said, the son said, what did God want in Jacob's life? What was God looking for in Jacob's life? God wanted to enlarge him to bring him to for him to bring out the prophetic destiny of the 12 tribes of Israel. That is why when God had finished dealing with Jacob, he could tell what each tribe would be. And uh, he could prophesy. And what he said remained. You know, so God wanted to enlarge him so that he could bring out. So the one reason was enlargement. And that will require a certain degree of intimacy with God and prophetic sharpness. That was the, the kind of vessel that God wanted Jacob to be. Somebody who was intimate with God and who was prophetically sharp to be able to execute the eternal purposes of God in time. As far as God's plan was concerned. Number two, God wanted to develop in him the stature of a progenitor to be a channel through which the Messiah would come. This will require that he develops a father's heart. A father's heart. So the second, the second thing God was looking for in Jacob's life was for Jacob to be a father. And when God wants you to be a father in your destiny, your, your heart will have to be stretched. Because a father's heart is large. You know why? It's just Joseph's brothers wanted to kill him. But his father covered him with a coat of many colors. His brothers were envious, but the father covered him. In, 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 in God was looking for that kind of heart in Jacob's life. Number three, God wanted to get a deeply spiritual person in Jacob to man the gates of heaven on earth to ensure that heaven's policies are implemented. That will require that he is separated unto holy use and that he becomes a pliable tool in the hands of God. That was God's target. So all the dealings of God that he took Jacob through was attain these three things. Prepare Jacob for divine destiny so that he will get to a point where he can indeed be a progenitor, a father, and also, he can release the prophetic destiny of the 12 tribes. Because the 12 tribes don't only have a physical destiny, they have a prophetic destiny. I don't have time to, you see, that all of us, all the body of Christ, we, we are a combination of various blends of the anointing that was on the 12 tribes. Yes. And uh, it was Jacob that was used as a vessel to birth the 12 tribes, to raise them, to prophetically uh, encode divine destiny into them. And such a man had to be a vessel, a tool in God's hand. God needs a pliable tool. Now, what does God want in a vessel? These, these things. It's not enough to be available. You have to be usable. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, 17, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God equips the one that he calls. So it's not enough to be available 
you have to be usable. God must be able to use you for his purpose. So you can say, oh, I'm available. God said, okay, you are available, but I can use you in this state because I need a vessel who has these qualities. Number one, God is looking for a separated vessel. A vessel that is holy, separated unto his use. So no matter what your assignment is, before you can fulfill your assignment, whether you have been called to be a businessman, to finance the kingdom, to be a leader in the secular world, to pave way for the, for the kingdom, to be a pulpit person, to preach the gospel, to be a, a mother, to release men, men and women of destiny, whatever your calling is, God will first of all demand that you become a separated vessel. And that's why his dealings will be all the tools you apply on you, they, they will be aiming at that end. The truth of the word and of experience, the things you allowed you to go through, all will be aimed at equipping you, shaping you to become a holy vessel so that he can fulfill his purpose through you. Number two, a pliable tool. A pliable tool is a tool that is flexible. That is flexible. A tool that when God turns this way, it will turn. When God turns that way, it will turn. Pliable. It can, it can use you for anything. Even sometimes, the vessel that God makes, he can destroy the vessel and form it into another vessel. But it has to be pliable. When you are set in your ways and you are straight, you are set in your ways and you are hardened in your, in your, in your, in your, in your, in your ways, God cannot use you. God, God will break you to become soft. Last week I said that we, we, can, we can be too expensive for God to use. God told Peter, he said, when you were a child, you tied your belt around your waist and went wherever you wanted. But as you mature, another will tie a belt around your waist and take you where you don't want to go. Because maturity comes with you being a pliable tool. You see, for instance, let me say your assignment is to become a billionaire and to be a kingdom financier. Let me tell you something. The same training God will take a pastor through, he will take you through the same training. You will go to the same school. The details may change, but the same lessons, you have to pick them. You have to come to a point where you become a pliable to where God can just whisper to you, release this, and then you release so for somebody like you like that, if you are tight-fisted, God will take you through process for you to come to a point where you truly say, all that I have is his. Because you can't be a kingdom financier if you are not pliable. If you choose where your money goes. If you are completely in charge of your money. He will bring you to a point where you are not in charge anymore. That with just a soft touch, he can just release. If you, he's going to train you, as a, as a pastor or as a pulpit person or as a minister of the gospel, the same. You have to get to a point where you become a pliable tool in God's hand so that God can lead you about. Whatever your assignment is, that's the vessel God was. He's looking for that. Number three, he's looking for a vessel that has a father's heart. At the peak of your destiny, you must be a father. And this, this refers to both the women and the men. When I say father, I use father in a generic sense to mean that you must, you see, because when you get to the peak of destiny, there are many, many destinies tied to your destiny. You can't afford not to have a father's heart. The reason why all the people God called in the Bible, God took them through process to develop a father's heart in them. Joseph, Joseph was not a father to start with. But later, after going through the process, he said, God has made me a father to Pharaoh. You can't father Pharaoh if God has not worked on your heart. He has not enlarged your heart. And the enlargement was through process. So all the things he went through, the hatred, the rejection, the betrayal, the, the false accusation, the imprisonment, the, the neglect, 
all those things were supposed to make Joseph a father, build a father's heart in Joseph. That's why after all things, he was never bitter against his brothers. He could still serve them and still love them. David, he was a shepherd, but God made him a father. These two things, shepherd and father, whatever your assignment is, God will work on you to cultivate these two things in your heart. You'll be a shepherd, then you'll be a father. David was a shepherd already, but God took David through a series of events that made David a father. By the time David sat on the throne, he had a large heart. He was not parochial in his, in his, in his thinking anymore. He had a large heart. He had a father's heart. Moses was trained as a soldier for 40 years in Egypt. When God called Moses and God said, I'm, I want you to go, uh, uh, when God uh, put it in Moses' heart, God had to send him to Midian for another 40 years just to develop the heart of a shepherd and a father. It took 40 years. He was, he was shepherding his father in lordship. He was learning how to be a shepherd because God wanted a shepherd to lead Israel, a shepherd and a father to lead Israel, you know, from Egypt to the promised land. You can't do that if you're not a father. Look at what Moses went through. Look at even, even when, when God asked him to do something, the people said they would stone him. So God knew what ahead of him. That's why he allowed Moses to go through all that. Could he be? That's one of the things we go through. God is targeting this kind of nature in our lives. It's not, it's, it's not automatic that you get a shepherd's heart or a father's heart. No. You have to be squeezed. You have to be cut. Cut and paste broken, molded. But if you are not broken, you can't. So, God will always be targeting that and always be shaping you. When you go to the potter's house, they are always breaking things. Break, mold, break, mold, break, mold. That is what God wants in you as a vessel. Then the fourth one is to develop prophetic accuracy. That your life will be prophetic. That you will be able to know. You see, that, that's why God, look at God's training. His training is so that you will, you, will, you will be able to adapt to his whims, his nuances, his movements, his drifts. You follow his trail. It takes prophetic sharpness. To even be able to follow God, to know what God is doing, what God wants you to do. At a certain point in your destiny, it will be suicidal if you are not prophetically accurate. So God will make sure he trains you. As part of your curriculum, you will go through things. The, 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 school, the school of God, the course content, it's not just the scriptures. It's the scriptures plus the discipline of the Holy Spirit, plus encounters, God will use all these tools to train you, shape you. Sometimes he will use a hammer on you, a chisel on you, he will use water on you, fire on you, he will use the sword on you to divide. By the time he gets what he's looking for, then he can say, this is my product. This is my man. This is my woman. This is my businessman. This is my politician. This is my housewife. <laughs> okay, so we are looking at Jacob's life. These are things that God was looking for in Jacob's life. And Jacob's school started when he left his father's house. 
His truth started. Then God put up the light. And let me tell you, I've told you this. Let me repeat. God is not a laissez-faire parent who easily yields because you cried or because you threw tantrums. No. He did not spare his son when his son was on the cross. Do you know that Jesus tried to convince the father, tried to, if you like, bribe the father, you know? I mean, I'm using that word advisedly. He said, Abba, Father. Abba, Father means dear daddy. All things are possible, dear daddy. Look at your child saying, dear daddy, in distress. God remove his eyes. Allowed him to go through. <laughs> because God was thinking beyond his suffering. There was glory ahead of his suffering. And in the Bible, there is no glory without suffering. You check. First Peter 1.11, the suffering of the Christ and the glories that should follow. Oh, there are so many scriptures. No suffering, no glory. Romans 8.17 is one of them. No suffering, no glory. Luke 24, he told the disciples, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and after that enter into his glory? He told the two disciples uh, on the road to Emmaus. Then when you read, um, I think, First Corinthians, Paul said, for a light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us an eternal weight of glory. There can be no glory without suffering. It's not in God's, God's plan. If you will have glory, you will have suffering. You will go through things. Because for you to sustain the glory, God must attain a particular kind of texture in you, the vessel. The, not If God allows you straight from your father's house to sit on Egypt's throne, you'll be a disaster, believe me. You will be a disaster if straight from your father's house, then the very next day, the prophecy is fulfilled and then you are on Egypt's throne. You will be a disaster. But look at God's process. To the pit. To Potiphar's house. To prison. Then to the palace. That's why, you see, do you know why God gave us the gift of praying in tongues? So that he can get you even if you don't want him to get you. Because you see, and do you know why the Holy Spirit, the one who is praying for us, Jesus prays for us, and the Holy Spirit prays through us, so that God's purpose for your life will come to pass. So that you, your will, you see, will be broken for his purpose to come to pass. Because if God left the thing to you, his glory will never come, because you will never go through the suffering. Yes, that's why when God calls you for instance, he will never tell you about the difficulties you face. Never. He will always tell you about the glorious things that will be the result. Never about the valleys and the down moments and all that. No, he will tell about the mountains. He will say, I will do this. I will make you this. When it's school time, then he said, this one too was part of it. So as you are praying, as Joseph is praying for um, Oh God, let your purpose my life. Father, you promised me. You said the sun, the moon, the stars will bow to me. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. As soon as you start praying, then the Holy Ghost will start praying. Father, take him to the pit. <laughs> Lord, the pit. The pit. That you are praying. Oh God, oh God, you said I will rule. You said I will be the head, not the tail. You said, oh God, nations will come to me. You said you will use me among nations. Then the Holy Spirit said, Father, what if first house? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is why God doesn't allow you to pray out your destiny. You will be a disaster. So he said, the spirit also makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered in articulate speech. Verse 27. For he that searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is. And he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. There's a will document that is controlling your destiny. I'm telling you. 
and God will have his way. God will have his way. He will break you if need be. He will hit you if need be. He will spank you if need be. But at the end, you have his way. Because when you get into your place of destiny, it's not about you anymore. It is God that gets glory. Destinies are tied to your loins. So God have patience for you. That he will, he will take you through. He will not spare you. Sometimes the prayer we pray for God to take us out of issues. Those prayers, if he listens to those prayers, will, our destiny will be messed up. I'm telling you. So, I'm not saying that we should entertain all issues. I'm saying that sometimes we are in a hurry to come out of certain seasons. You can't rush God's seasons. When you get pregnant, you know you must carry the baby for nine months. For nine months. You can never reduce the time. Nature has set the time. He said the father has appointed the time in his bosom. Not your time. So Jacob had to learn this the hard way. For a period of 20 years, he was serving Laban. And you know, Laban, my, my, my. That guy is good. The guy, you see, you see, Jacob thought that he was strong and smart and a, a, you know a smart guy i can bargain my way out negotiate my way out i can fight my way through he met laban and laban taught him that the um the beard came to meet the eyebrow <laughs> <laughs> see you a small boy you don't know what is now family that cheating spirit is in the blood. You think you are a cheat. I will let you know that I am your uncle. <laughs> you, you came to meet me in the world. So, for a period of 20 years, now he served Laban for 14 years for his two daughters and then six years for his wages. And he changed his wages 10 times. The first deception was, he said, okay, serve me. And, uh, what do you want? He said, I'm in love with your second daughter, Rahel. Jacob said, okay, seven, seven years. And he said for seven years. And the Bible said the seven years were like few days because he loved Rahel. At the wedding day, because those days there was no light. And the wedding was in the night. And the woman had been veiled. So Jacob did not see who he was marrying. So he thought he was marrying Rahel. Then when they went for the honeymoon, he, I know, he didn't even see. After he had done everything, you know, I, I mean, I, don't, I didn't even know why Jacob did not see. <laughs> I mean, I did, it's so strange. It's so strange. The following morning, they said, ah, it's Leah you gave me. The fair deception. And you see, so he had to marry. And the labor said, okay, in our country, we don't give the younger before the older. So, serve me seven years for the younger. And then he gave Rahel to him there. So, the, the, so Rahel was more like, um, get it now and pay later. Okay, so for the next seven years, he had two wives working for Rahel, paying the diary. But he, he hated uh, Leah because Leah was not a stress. But you know something, Leah was a very spiritual woman. She had weak, high, weak eyes. Weak eyes. The Bible says Leah had weak eyes. That term, weak eyes, means watery eyes. Her eyes were watery. So physically, her eyes were weak. But she had spiritual sight. And Leah, look at the name she gave her sons. Reuben means I see. Levi, no, Simon means I hear. Levi means attached. Judah means praise the Lord. Then she stopped bearing children. So later, later on. She was a very spiritual woman, but Jacob didn't like her. Jacob won. Rahel was very beautiful, but never spiritual. When they were leaving Laban's house, Rahel stole his father's gods, household gods. That, that, that was why she died like that. She stole the gods, and Laban came to set for his gods. His gods were stolen. And Jacob said, 
Whoever you find the ghost with, let the person die. He didn't know it was Rahel who had stolen the ghost. So she put the, the, the ghost on something that she sat on it. And the father came and then the father could not find the ghost. And so they made peace and all that. Later, as she was giving birth, she died. She gave birth to Joseph and then said, the Lord will add another son. But in the presence of birth, giving birth to Benjamin, he died. And she named Benjamin Benoni, the son of my sorrows. Look at Leah's line and, and the way she named her children. But as prophetic as she was, Jacob did not like Leah. Jacob wanted Rahel. And all these things were things that God were using to craft something to develop that kind of texture in Jacob. Because for his assignment, you see, the most important son that Jacob had was Joseph. And I, I, I'll show you later on what, what, why I'm saying that. For his assignment, God had to take him through that. Then labor, come to 31 verse, 40, verse 41. Um, Genesis 31 verse 36 to 41. Okay. Then Jacob was angry and rebuked Laban. This was after he had come to search them. Jacob answered and said to Laban, What is my trespass? What is my sin? That you have so hotly pursued me. Although you, were, you, are, you have said all my things, what part of your household things have you found? Study here before my brethren and your brethren that they may judge between us both. These 20 years I've been with you. Your ewes and your female goods have not miscarried their young and have not eaten the rounds of your flock. That which was torn by beasts, I did not bring to you. I bore the loss of it. You required it from my hand, whether stolen by day or stolen by night. Laban was a hard man. That sometimes God can send you to go and work under a very difficult person. And you may be praying for him to die or her to die. You don't know that it's part of your destiny. That person, that landlord that you said you should die. He's God's agent in God's quarry. God wants to develop a father's heart, compassion in you. The things we go through, God wants to birth compassion in us. If you have not been through anything, you don't have compassion. That's why if you have not given birth before, sometimes you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't understand. You don't understand. If you, hand, if you give your child into the care of somebody who has not been given birth before, the person can be very careless. Oh yes, it's true. They, they don't know how it, it can cost you blood and water. They think that giving birth is like going to the toilet. You sit down and pro, it drops. Pro, it drops. <laughs> there I was, in the day drug consumed me, and the frost by night, and my sleep departed from my eyes. Jacob is recounting his experience. Thus, I've been in your house 20 years. I served you 14 years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages 10 times. <laughs> oh, unless the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. All these things that Jacob went through, it was because of the prophecy, the destiny of God for his life. He said, God has seen my afflictions, you know, in Laban's house alone, afflictions. Now, after Laban's house, he was going to meet his brother Esau. And that was what he dreaded most. The man who was a schemer, who was a smart guy, now he prayed for the first time in his life. You never see Jacob praying. The, the only time Jacob prayed was when he was about to meet Esau. He was afraid. Then he prayed to God. 
That was the first time. I want us to read that. Now, Genesis 32, verse 22. Let's read from verse 9. Verse 9. Genesis 32, verse 9. Then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will deal well with you. I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of the truth you have shown your servant. Was not the guy who said, if you will clothe me and give me food, then I will become, I'll, I'll serve you, become my God. He was giving God conditions. The same person, now he said, I'm not even worthy. The things you've done for me, I'm not even worthy. He was a changed man because of what he had been through. He was so full of himself at the beginning. But you will see a lot of changes. He said, for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I've become two companies. The, the, the children of Leah, and then the children of um, Rahel, and then those of the maids. Because when Leah stopped bearing children, he, she gave her maid to Jacob as a wife. So Jacob married four wives and produced 12 sons. Four wives and produced 12 sons. Hmm. So, that's why in the Bible you will see um, four trees of life. One in Genesis, three in Revelation. But you see that it bore 12 manner of fruits. Just 12. Four trees of life. But in Revelation, all the four came together to bear just 12 manner of fruits. So I, that's why I'm saying that Jacob was doing something beyond just producing children. There was a very prophetic dimension to his life. And such a person, God will not let you go scot free. Okay, so, yes, verse, verse 12, verse 11. Okay. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. <laughs> now, now he was a responsible person. For you said, I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as the son of the sea. We cannot be numbered for multitude. Hmm. So now, then let's jump to, okay, let, you, you, you stay there. So he lodged there that same night and took what came to his hand as a present for Esau, his brother. Now he, he had prayed, but he was still scheming. He was still planning. In fact, even the way he arranged them, um, the sons of the maid servants were first. Then the sons of Leah, Leah and her sons were second. Then Rahel and her sons were last. In that order. So by the time Jacob, Esau finished killing the mid servants and then Leah's children, then he can hide Rahel. That was his thing. He was a smart, he was too smart. Because here, God had not finished living with Jacob. God had dealt with a certain aspect of him for his, even, his, his speech to even now change. But his, his craftiness was still there. Continue. 200 female goods and 20 male goods. 200 eels and 20 rams. 30 male camels with their colts. 40 cows and 10 bulls. 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. These were the present. Then he delivered them to the hand of his servant every drove by itself and said to his servant, pass over before me and put some distance between successive droves. And he commanded the first one saying, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, saying, to whom, do, to whom do you belong and where are you going? Whose are these in front of you? Then he shall say, these are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent to my lord Esau. And behold, he also is behind us. So he commanded the second and third, and who followed the drove, saying, In this manner you shall speak to Esau when you find him. 
So he sent the gifts ahead. He, he, he was a smart man. Because he knows that a man's gift will make room for him. He was using his mind. He had prayed, but he, 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 he was too scheming. Okay. And also say, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me. And afterward, I will see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present went over before him. But he himself lodged the, that night in the camp. Now, so, then he arose that night and took his two wives and his two, his two female servants and his living sons, and he crossed over the fort of Jabok. Okay. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Now, so Jacob was left alone. This was the moment of destiny where all of God's dealings were going to make sense. He started God's school in the night with an encounter. And he was going to graduate without an encounter. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, that is, the man saw that he didn't prevail against Jacob. That man was God, was an angel, and was God. In Hosea 12, verse 3, we, we see that Jacob prevailed, struggled with a man, with an angel, and then with God. That man was uh, an angel and also a God. He, he said he took his brother by the heel in the womb. In his strength, he, he struggled with God. That man was God. God in the flesh. That should let you know how daring this man Jacob is. I mean, for you to struggle with God and for God to say, and you have prevailed. So go back. So when the man, okay, why did the man struggle with Jacob? That was what was happening in the spirit. The last enemy standing between Jacob and his destiny was himself. And uh, he had to struggle the man had to wrestle. You see, in God's dealing, sometimes he shakes you. Sometimes he pulls you out of, of a vessel into another vessel. Those are part of God's dealing. Apart from breaking, pruning, he can shake your world. He can pour you out from one vessel to another vessel. So that the impurities, you know, when you pour the water, the, the wine into another vessel, it settles. Then you pour it again, then it settles. Then you pour it again. There are some people... The way God is dealing with them is like that. They never have a permanent address. Yes. God, is, God sifts the, the dregs from the wine by emptying you from vessel to vessel. Vessel to vessel. But with Jacob, there was a wrestling. So he touched the socket of his hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. I belong to the night, not the day. I'll send to camp, to climax all you have been going through. You are still in the night. But you see, when the day is breaking, uh, you don't see the, the, the sun all of a sudden. The day will not break all of a sudden. Even when it's five, you see darkness in the atmosphere. You know, sometimes when it's four, so this one, that angel was the same angel that had been accompanying Jacob, you know, and all that. Now, he had to meet God. This graduation. He said, I will not let you go. He said, let me go for the daybreak. But he said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. So there was an exchange. So when he said, unless you bless me, then the next question that he asked him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. See, they were shouting. They were not, not, well, it was a wrestling. If you are wrestling with somebody, you see, you are using your energy. So your words will come out with force. My name is Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God <laughs> and with men and have prevailed. 
Yes. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name. He wanted to find out. Who are you? What is your name? Then he, I, he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him then. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I've seen God face to face. And my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip. Now, when he got to Bethel, God put up the light. The sun set. After 20 years or so, after, after this encounter, now the sun rose, but he was limping. The last enemy that God had to deal with was I can. I am had been dealt with because his identity was in crisis. Because if you are walking about with somebody as if you are first born, as if you are second born, you don't know. You were born as second born, but by reason of certain things, you are now first born. You know, and you are having all these struggles and all that. Then the I will was also dealt with because he didn't have his way. 20 years under labor, he didn't have his way. The schema and all that. Then this one, I can. God dealt with I can. He, was, he, he thought he was strong. Therefore, to this day, so Jacob was limping. He was limping. He thought he was strong. But he realized that he, he can't. God, he, he touched the hip. And this part of the body, the, the thigh bone is the strongest. That gives you support and stability. God touched it. There are some people, the day they really got to know God was when God dried up their sources. That was when they got to know God as provider. There are some who got to know God as healer when they realized that I had to believe God for this. There are some who got to know God as father when their earthly fathers died. There are many ways that God, you see, the, same, the, the aspect of the flesh that is very strong in your life, it is through that same avenue that God will orchestrate circumstances to deal with that thing. If it is pride, you will see things that will come to humiliate you. Because you see, if you walk with God, you must strip. You can't walk with God with your clothes on, you must strip. If you strip, it is called humility. If he strips you, it is called humiliation. It is God's duty to lift you up and yours to humble yourself. If you lift yourself up, you are trying to do God's duty and he will do your duty for you. <laughs> By the time God finished with Jacob, you see, the work of God is like this. Every mountain will come down and the valleys will be exalted then the crooked places will be made straight. Then the rough places will be made smooth. Then all flesh, I'm talking about Isaiah 40 verse 3 now, all flesh will see his glory. So after God's dealings, the target is that all flesh, not just you, all flesh will see his glory. But your mountains will be crushed. Then your valleys your fears and all that God will fill them up then the crooked places your crooked dealings and lifestyle God will straighten you up that is why there are some people they have to go to prison then in prison they encounter destiny their crooked places some are exposed after that true repentance comes their crooked places God will use everything to make sure that the path is straight for the Lord. Because when the Lord comes, He's coming for many people who are tied to your loins. The day God, you enter into destiny, the peak of your destiny, you will thank God for all the things you have been through. There are, there are areas that you can never minister to people unless God takes you through certain processes. You can never have compassion 
unless you are broken. You will never have humility unless you are broken. You can never have meekness unless you are broken. And God will break you, make sure you are broken so that you can, you can, you can, you can humble yourself. Because if you are too proud, you cannot be a true in the hands of God. God can say, do this. Yes, sir. Do this. I won't do. Go here. Oh, yes, I'll go. Go here. Ah, no, nothing will come from that. I won't go. It means that your life is in your hand. But after God's process where he strips you of all this, I am, I will, I can, you will become so tender. Look at Jacob. Now, there are, there, are, there are some transitions in Jacob's life. I want to give them to you. About five of them. So, this one was the last stage. And then God dealt with him. And then he was now Israel. Then the sun rose on him. Now, the first transition was from blessing to the blessing. Isaac, his father, blessed him with the blessing of Abraham. But when he encountered the angel, encountered God, he said, I won't let you go till you bless me. At that time, he had become spiritual. He was after the things of the spirit. It wasn't just after the dew of heaven, the fathers of death. He was after a company of kings will come out of your loins. He was, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was desiring for something more than material blessing. So he said, I have all these things on my head, but I want the blessing. So when God works in you, on you, you'll get to a place where you will know what really matters. What is really the treasure? You will know. You will know what is really important. When God finishes his work, your eyes will open. You will see the important things of life. When it happens like that, you will not be able to fit into many things. God doesn't want you to be blessed. He wants you to be a blessing. So Jacob was blessed, but he was not a blessing. He said, I, if, bless me. And the blessing he gave Jacob was that he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. A name is not just nomenclature. A name is identity. A name is status. A name is nature. A name is function. What is in the name? Identity. Status. Nature. Function. That is the name. So his identity was changed. His controversial identity was settled forever. Because Israel is God's firstborn. Then his nature was changed. The hard, strong will Jacob now becoming somebody who was pliable in God's hand. Becoming meek. Smart man now becoming dependent on God. is limping, not depend on his strength. Because by strength shall no man prevail. When he started the journey, he was so strong to even give God conditions. If you do this and that, then you'll be my God. Then I'll pay tithe. Then this house, this stone will become a house of God. After God's dealings, now the man was dependent on God. Now he was praying to God. Okay, so that was the first transition. He was. Now come to Genesis 35, verse 9 to 13. You see, God appeared to give him a third blessing. After the encounter with the angel. At Bethel, God said, I will. I will. I will do this. I will do that. I will do that. that that's the beginning. That's I will. Look at this one. Then God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. Then God said, your name is Jacob. Your name shall not be Jacob anymore. So God was reminding him that, no, don't forget where I took you from. But Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said, I am almighty God. Be fruitful. The very first time God was giving Jacob that blessing. This was a promise. Be fruitful. Be. 
the same, the same as saying, light be, and there was light. There's a difference between, I will bless you, and then be blessed. Be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. Anytime God pronounced be fruitful, it means that there's a new season. He did that to Adam and that to Noah, be fruitful and multiply, and that to Jacob, be fruitful. He said, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac, I give to you, not I will give to you. See that the language has changed. And to your descendants after you, I give this land, not I will give. It's no longer a promise. Now God is saying, now it's time for manifestation. Be fruitful. Then God went out from him in the place where he talked with him. This was God and Jacob. This was the real blessing that Jacob, all the things he went through, it was for this blessing. Now, people think that the blessing of God is material stuff. So you know what God does? God, God blesses you materially. Then at a point, you get to know that those things don't satisfy. So God will bless you. Those are byproducts. When God starts blessing you financially, know that that's not the end. They are just byproducts of your work with God. It's like you are, you are, you are after, after oil and gas, but the crude can produce many other things in the process, you know. But the main thing is the, is the, is the petrol or the diesel that you are looking for. So you are going through a refinery and then you get material blessing. Praise God. You get breakthroughs. Praise God. You get all these things. Praise God. They are, they are all good and God will give them to you. But God is giving them to you for you to know that that is not the, the real and the final blessing. The real blessing is to get to a point where you are the blessing. Do you know these two things, which one is power? To get money or to be able to tell somebody, be rich, and then you are rich. Which one is more powerful? There's some kind of blessing that does not just come. It's not just the things you can touch. God will give you those things just for you to know that, okay, you are making progress. He's with you on the journey and all that. Usually, when God gives us those things, we think that we have come to the end of the journey. There are many people, when they start ministry, you see they are paying the price and all that. Then God begins to open doors for them and give them material possession, cars and all that and all that. Then they retire. They, but you see, those things are just stepping stones. Jacob was not a poor man by this time that he was asking for blessing. He was a rich man. He had a lot of things from his hard work, labor and all that. But he said, bless me indeed because these things don't constitute blessing. These things are blessing of an inferior order. I want to be the blessing. He said, I will bless you and make your name great, Abraham, and you shall be a blessing. When God makes your name great, the purpose is for you to be a blessing. When God promotes you and the kingdom does not benefit, that is no promotion at all. You have not hit the target that God wants you to hit. We must understand that these blessings, they are means to an end, not the end in themselves. So when all our prayers that God bless me, we have missed it. You don't have to pray for blessing. God will bless you. These things, what you eat, what material things and all that, if you, are, you work with God, they are byproducts. But the real blessing will come after we will see whether you are truly blessed. When you get money. That is when we will put our eyes down to see whether you are truly blessed. Because it's more better to give than to receive. Number two transition that Jacob had in his life. God made him, God enlarged him from a stone to a house. He was enlarged from a stone to a house. You know, the first encounter, he saw a stone. Throughout the Bible, only once where you will see house of Isaac, only once in Amos. Everywhere, house of Jacob. House of Jacob abounds in scripture. Everywhere, house of Jacob. God made him a house. 
When we say God has made you a house, it means that your destiny, many destinies are now tied to your loins. He said, I cross over this river with one staff. Now God has made me two companies. It was now a house. There were many people tied to his loins. You see, you see God at the point where you are, you are single, at the point where you have a house. It's the same thing. Many, many years to come, you can, we can trace your descendants. Say, the house of so and so. It's the same thing, spiritually speaking. Also the same, the same thing. No matter your assignment, no matter your destiny, your assignment, your destiny will be tied to many, many other destinies. And so God will enlarge you through the process and make you a father figure, a father. Yes. When we say father, it's not about ministry, about pulpit ministry per se. No. Whatever your destiny, your assignment is, God wants to take you to a place of a father. And a father is a house. God will enlarge you from one stone. Break the stone, enlarge you, become a house. So that you see that the place that you are ministering, what you are, you are serving, if it is ministry, that place of service, you find yourself reproducing after your kind. You find yourself giving birth. You find yourself nurturing people. If it is business, you find yourself, you find yourself destinies tied to your, your table. People feeding from your table. Bless being a blessing to people. people you, you, that, that is what God wants to do in your life. That is the reason for all the stretching. All this stretching. So that you not think only about your family. Some of you think that, oh, God is going to bless me because I have to take care of my family. No, God is taking care of our family. If it was for you and your family alone, you wouldn't go through what you're going through. What you are going through is, is too much for just you and your small family. No, that one. But God is preparing you for something beyond you and your small family. But you see, it's a state of the heart. It's a texture of the soul. And God will do his work. Number three, transition. Oh, from Bethel to El Bethel. Jo Jacob made a transition from Bethel to El Bethel. Remember the first encounter, he named the place Bethel. And Bethel means house of God. But go to Genesis 35 from from. The one we read, 35, from verse 1. Let me see from verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household, as you were with him, put away the foreign gods that are among you, purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make an altar there to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and has been with me in the way which I have gone. Now you see that now you begin to understand that he, I mean, now he's serving God. This was this was after the encounter with the angel. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which they were which were in their hands, and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree, which was by Satan. Sitchin means cleansing. Cleansing. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were all around them, and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. So Jacob came to lose, that is Bethel, the first place that he the first place that he started, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel. Because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. So the first place of encounter was called Bethel. And now he called that place El Bethel. El Bethel means the God of the house of God. Bethel means house of God. El Bethel means the God of the house of God. So it's like this. You come to the house of God. You can be in the house of God. And have not met the God of the house. 
So you can be in Bethel, having all the activities going on, by the time comes where you must make a transition from the house of God and then have an encounter with the God of the house so that you can say, my God, not just the God of my father. My, the God of my father has now become my God. Paul could say the God of Abraham, but he could say, my God shall supply. He had come to a place where now that God has had become his God. It's not enough to Know the house of God. You see, when you come to God, God will introduce you to the house of God. Bethel. Bethel is where everything about discipleship starts. From Gilgal, you have to go to Bethel. You know, in Elijah, Elijah's journey, from Gilgal, they went to Bethel. Gilgal is a place where the reproach is rolled away. Where they, they were circumcised, like the place where you are born again. The Bethel is discipleship, the house of God. But the journey is to get to El Bethel, where now the God of the house, you encounter him. That is where you can be fruitful. You can enter a house and not know the one who controls the house. So you can enter a place and the spirit of the place has not entered you. You can enter. That's why he said you can see the kingdom, but then it's another thing to enter the kingdom for it to enter you. You can have the peace of God and that will help you. It says the peace of God will guard you, will guard your heart. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. It said be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. But do you know, Romans 16, verse, 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 verse 20, you know what is there. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The peace of God can guard your heart, but the God of peace will crush, not the God of war. When you truly have an encounter with God in the house of God, the God of the house, something, something lasting takes place. So the God of peace will crush Satan. So the, the peace of God, the God of peace. The house of God, the God of the house. There is such a journey that we must make. The reason for God's dealings is to make that journey. Number four. Jacob to Israel to Jeshurun. We thought or we think Jacob limped all his life. No. Prophetically, he was able to walk straight again. The limping was for a season. It was supposed to be a scar. But he left. He, uh, he, he, he walked again. So from Jacob to Israel, that his name was changed again to Jeshurun. Jeshurun. Before Jacob met Esau, he prayed for the first time. After his encounter, we saw a change Jacob to Israel. In Israel, we see the fatherliness of Jacob, his tenderness, sensitivity, gentleness, and patience. Genesis 33, verse 13 to 14. When Esau met him, let me show you how his nature as Jacob went to Israel. You see from his attitude. But Jacob said to him, that's to Esau, my Lord knows that the children are weak and the flocks and herds which are nursing are with me. If the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please, let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at the pace with the livestock that go before me and the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord in Seir. This is talking about somebody who was now a father after the encounter. This was after he encountered the angel. Look at this Jacob who didn't think about anybody. Now look at Jacob thinking about the children and the weak and the women with, 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 
who are pregnant. Say, I don't, I don't, I don't want to drive them hard. I want to go slowly. He had become tender, he had become gentle, and he had become patient. Why? God had worked on him. God had worked on him. There are certain things by the time you finish going through, oh, you, 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 you'll you you be sober. When you see people who are very, very, very confident, very confident, they have not been through anything. Yes. When you have been through things, you will lose self-confidence and you will get God confidence. You, you will see that it is vain to trust in the arm of flesh. You will make this God your God. You will make God your trust. He said, blessed is the man whose trust is in God. And then blessed is the man whose trust is God. The two are different. So you, the, you, your trust is in God. It's okay. But when God becomes your trust, it's like from Bethel to El Bethel. But I've not gotten there. After the angel came and all that, then he limped, started limping. So from Jacob, he became Israel. Then from Israel, he became Jeshurun. Hmm. Isaiah 44 verse 2. Jeshurun. Jeshurun means upright. It means no limp. That's the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb. Who helped you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant. And you, Jeshurun. Whom I've chosen. That word Jeshurun means one who walks upright. No limp. So after the encounter, Jacob can still walk upright, but the limp is in his heart. Oh, yes. You can see Jacob. That's why when, when God takes you through a process, you will get to a point where God can bless you abundantly, but you will still walk upright. God can bless you with a lot of abundance. You can still be humble. God can increase the authority over your life, but you will still be humble because the limp is in your heart. Not that you go about wearing rags, so God is dealing with me. No, 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 no. no. You can wear the best and still be humble. The limp will be there. It will be in your heart. God can lift you high and you can still wait for the, the, the flock that are weak, that are coming. You can still go at their pace. That is the beauty of God's dealing. That is Jeshurun. Jeshurun. The limp is for a season. But there must be a testament of scars on you. I'm ending. I said, don't trust anybody without a limp. But see, the thing is that you will get to know the person's limp through the person's attitude. Because the limp is in your heart. When you are too strong, when you are too resourceful, when you have many, many sources, you can't see God's glory. When you have many, many sources, many opinions shaping your life, not God's opinion. God will train you to come to a point where you have an audience of one. Where you are prepared to be a fool in the eyes of men and still stand before God that you appear to be wise and miss God. Where you rather go with, the, with God than to go with the majority. All those God used in the Bible, they were in the minority and they fought against a tide. Noah was alone preaching flood and nobody was listening to him. Lot was alone preaching brimstone and fire. Nobody listened to him. They were all alone. Abraham was alone on this path there comes a point where you must decide that I will rather, rather stick, stick with God. I will rather die with God than live without God. That's the point where you see there's a limp. There's a point of no turning back. Who can convince this Jacob that God is not real? No turning back. We must cross that line where our minds are unstable. Where we can decide that I won't serve God again. That, that, that there's nothing. That we must get to a point where now it's too late. We have burned the ship that we came, we came with. It's too late to go back. 
you have, you, have, you have traveled over the sea. When you go to the island, you burn the ship. You either fight or you are killed. No going back. You see a prophetic Jacob. Oh. A prophetic Jacob. When he encountered God at Bethel, he didn't even know God was there. I mean, look at, look at this awesome. He said, God was in this place I never knew. The guy was nothing prophetic. But come to Jacob in Genesis 48. Hmm. You see Jacob of um, Genesis 48. Now it came to pass after this thing that Joseph was told, Indeed, your father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Verse 2. And Jacob was told, Look, your son Joseph is coming to you. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up. It was Jacob that was sick, but Israel strengthened himself and sat up. Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me in Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me. And said to him, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply, and I will make you of a multitude of people, and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. And now your two sons, Ephraim <laughs> and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. As Reuben and Simon, they shall be mine. Look at how Jacob named them. You see, Manasseh was the firstborn. Now, Jacob says, Ephraim and Manasseh, they are mine. It means that we will count them up among, among the 12 tribes. Just that like we count Reuben and Simon. So, spiritually speaking, Manasseh and Ephraim, they are sons of Jacob, not grandsons of Jacob. It was Jacob that changed the order. So, you see the 12 tribes. You see that Levi was taken out, no inheritance. Then, in place of Levi, you will see that Manasseh and uh, Ephraim, Manasseh came. Ruby too was, was cleared. Now, continue. Say, this shall be mine. Your offspring, whom you beget after them, shall be yours. They will be called by the name of their brother's inheritance. But Ephraim, Manasseh have taken them. They are mine. Don't joke with spiritual grandparents. In the Bible, grandparents were powerful. <laughs> uh, okay. Go to verse 7. But as for me, when I came from Padan, Rahel died beside me in the land of Cana on the way. When there, he was, there was, okay, and I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. That's where she died. Where, where, where she said, Benoni, son of my sorrows. And uh, Jacob said, Benjamin, son of my right hand. It was at that place that he was, she was buried. That's when, you see, in Bethlehem, when the children were killed, the prophet said, Rahel is weeping for her, her children. They are no more, and she refused to be comforted. It was because, of, because she was buried in Bethlehem. But let's move on. Then Israel saw Joseph's sons, which means that when he was mentioning their names, he had not seen them. And he said, who are these? <laughs> he just said to his father, they are my sons whom God has given me in this place. And he said, please bring them to me and I will bless them. Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age so that he could not see. Not his spiritual eyes. His physical eyes were dim, but his spiritual eyes were so sharp. Then Joseph brought them near to him and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see your face. See, Israel is not speaking. But in fact, God has also shown me your offspring. So Joseph brought them from beside his knees and he bowed down with his face to the earth. He was talking to Israel now. You see, Israel is the prophetic nature of Jacob. That was at the result of God's dealings. It was Israel that was going to perform the acts now. And Joseph took them both. Ephraim with his right hand. Ah, okay. Let's assume this is this, this Israel. So your left, right hand is here. So he took Ephraim, the, the younger one, with his right hand toward Israel's left hand. Then 
Manasseh with his left hand toward Israel's right hand. Because, uh, uh, left hand. Because the, the firstborn, he must lay his hands, his hands on the firstborn, the right hand on the firstborn. And brought them near. Then Israel, it's not Jacob. Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands knowingly. His eyes were dim, but he saw, he knew what he was doing. For Manasseh was the firstborn. So Israel changed their place. Then he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me all my life long to this day. And the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the last. Let my name be named upon them and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And let them grow into a multiple. You see, Jacob wanted to tell him that, look, he called on his fathers. It's a stream. Do you know the meaning of Manasseh? The Manasseh means to forget about your father's house. And he was, he was um, Joseph's firstborn. When Joseph gave it, he said, uh, God has made me forget my father's house, the, the pain and the toil of my father's house. Manasseh is a generation of, of sons who forget their father's house. That when God prospers you, then your, your father or your mother who sacrificed sold things to give you an edu education or to give you something. You forget about them. That, that was what happened to Joseph. Because in, in Egypt, now he had become a prime minister. But Ephraim means fruitfulness. In fact, it means double fruitfulness. So Jacob switched. Jacob was doing something. Because a time will come when Ephraim will have to come and lead Israel into the promised land. In fact, it was Ephraim who led Israel into the promised land. Joshua came from the tribe of Ephraim. Moses led Israel from Egypt to the end of the promise of the, of the wilderness. Then Ephraim led Israel into the promised land. That's why the promised land is it, it marks fruitfulness. Now, look at what Joseph did, verse, verse 17. Then Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on head of Manasseh. It displeased him, so he took hold of his father's hand. <laughs> To remove it from Manasseh's head, Ephraim's head, to Manasseh's head. And Jesus said to his father, not so my father, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people and he shall become, also become, be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he. <laughs> <laughs> verse, verse, verse 20 <laughs> so he blessed them that day saying by you Israel will bless saying may God make you as Ephraim and Manasseh and that he set Ephraim before Manasseh prophetic Jacob the one who said oh God was here I didn't know Hush. now look at what he's doing he's changing the whole generation but you see he crossed his hand. He said, Ephraim, Ephraim, you are the younger, but I bless you. I confer on you firstborn status. And Manasseh, you become second born. You can't give what you don't have. That's what he had that he gave. One day, my sister called me and said, pray for me. I want another child. Then I promised her, I said, you'll give birth. I said, you'll give birth to a girl. He said, no, I want a boy. I said, you can't give what you don't have. What I have, I give unto you. And then she gave birth to a girl. Then she told me again, I want another one. I said, you want another one? 
Okay. You, 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 they said, no, please don't. <laughs> what I have is what I give you. Gosh. I'm telling you, girls are a blessing. Just, uh, last week, my daughters came and said, Daddy, did you ever pray for a boy? I said, no. I never pray for a boy. I never pray for a boy or a girl. I never, not even once. I said, no, I didn't pray for a boy. I didn't pray for a girl. God just gave you to me as his heritage. He said, so if you had given birth to a boy, what would you have done? I said, that I now would have done 40 days fasting. <laughs> Look at the prophetic Jacob. Prophetic Jacob that now he's setting generations. And now he changed Ephraim and Manasseh. Bless them. That is, that is why he was going through all the cheating, all the things, all the rising and falling, everything at the end. He was a beautiful Jacob. A progenitor, a patriarch, a father, a pliable tool in the house of God. Now, if it, Isaac was dim and he mistakenly or was deceived into prosecuting heaven's policy, Jacob guided his hands wittingly. Do you know the difference? Isaac never went through anything. Isaac never went through anything in life. He received everything. Jacob had to go through for what was on his head to enter his heart. So he said he, his hand was, he knew. He said, I know my son, I know. I know. He guided his hand wittingly. Do you know that if God doesn't take you through anything and he puts you on the throne, you'll be like Adam who never experienced anything. That is why when the last Adam came, he said, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. The reason why God had to allow his son to go through temptation, go through testings and trials, was because he wanted to prove him as a son so that he would not just be like Adam who was just put on the throne, but he would be like the son who learned many things through the things he suffered. Don't despise the things you go through. Don't despise them. It will get to a point, your trials will become treasures. You can hold them like that as landmarks. Somebody called me and then he was telling me something. He said, Daddy, I think I need prayers. I said, no, no. I said, this thing you are going through, I've been through it several times. I said, it's not prayers. You need encouragement, not prayers. I said, you need encouragement, not prayers. Because I've been there, I've been there. And I began to let, tell him the instances. I've been there. You see, that, that, what, what you are going through, you are not going through for your own. You are going through so that you can provide answers for mentorship. There are people, you see, when pe people will come into your life, that by just one word, you will deliver them from whatever they're going through. Just by one word. So you think you are going through a lot and you are complaining. Don't complain. Cry, but don't complain. Cry. You can be sad, but don't complain. Because at the back of your mind, you should know that God is enlarging your heart. There are do you know there are people only Joyce Meyer can, can minister to them? Do you know why there are some people when Joyce Meyer is speaking, they are crying? They are touched. Because the rivers that are flowing from here, they have come out of brokenness. You know, the alabaster box had to be broken for the fragrance to come out. Because of the things she went through. And God was there. God was watching. And God was watching. Going through all those things. Refining herself. Refining her, 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 her function. Refining her vessel. At the end. She becomes prophetic. Let's be on our feet. God's quarry. That is where all of God's dealings are. So there were certain things only Jacob did in the Bible. Did it twice. At Bethel, he anointed a pillar, you know, and then he said, this pillar will be the house of God. Then, at El Bethel, 
did the same thing, but this time he poured drink offering and then anointed the pillar. These two things only Jacob did. We are praying. We are asking the Lord, keep me through. Keep me. Keep me. See, we must pray. God, keep me. Maybe you are praying that, oh God, take this away from me. Tell him to keep you. Keep me, oh God. Keep me strong. Keep me true. Keep me. Grant me grace. Hope. Oh, for some of you, the time you will pray this prayer has not come. Now you don't see the importance of this prayer. You don't see. Some of you, you don't see. By the time will come where you will see that on a daily basis, you have to pray to God. Keep me, oh God. Keep me. Keep me. Keep me, oh God. Give me grace. Strengthen me. Strengthen my feet. I know you are true. I know you are true. I know you are faithful. But keep me. Keep me, O oh God, lest I wander from the path of the wise. Keep my feet, O oh God. Doesn't matter what I go through. Keep me on the path of destiny. Lest I, I, I wander from the assembly of the wise of the wise. Mande brede de sita la baha. E brede ko sita la balo silhada. E kapra taliba kotis. Mande brede kito shalaha. O brata la makuder hada sita la baha. Mande brede keti braha talogos kereha. O meke brede do silha libro do taska. Me krapati alahas. Libro do sikiha polin mahas. Ratala kata ikro pototos mata pali matuliata ika pati ala mahalibus repeke skiraha nos bani prantala makandu brehede buska oh pahatara I see the Lord pouring oil and wine oil and wine He said that I'm I'm binding wounds I'm binding wounds oil and wine. On your wounds, I see God doing a deeper work in people. Oh Jesus, Hobrehetere Makuta la Mahales, Veleba Halas, Velebra da Kuta, In Mahata, Le Cretetes, Makapati Pratata, Oh Bolotilehas, the grace to yield, the grace to yield, the grace to yield, the grace to yield, in the name of Jesus, the grace to yield, in the name of Jesus. The grace to yield in the name of Jesus. The grace to conform to the image. To be conformed to the image. The grace to be pliable. To be a pliable tool. To be sensitive to him. To be a pliable tool. In the name of Jesus. To say yes to him. To say yes to him. Yes, Lord. I yield. Yes, Lord. I surrender. Yes, Lord. I give, I give you full control. I give you full control. I give you full control. The end will be better. The end will be glorious. The end will be better. The end will be bigger. The end will be greater. The end will be glorious. It's going to be better. Better the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. The end, though your beginning is small, yet your latter end shall greatly increase. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former. The end, the end, at the end, the vision will speak. It will not lie. Though it tarries, yet it will speak. It will come to pass at the end. At the end, at the end, it will speak. Oh, Bahata Rabakosha. Some of you, God is fashioning, fashioning an intercessor out of you. 
The things you are going through, you are building muscles because your destiny fulfillment is a release of the destiny of nations. God will release nations, their destinies through you. And God will have, have a vessel that is yielded to him. God will have a vessel that is yielded to him. You have a vessel that is yielded to him. For some of you, your voice, your voice is going to control multitudes. And therefore, God will have you as a vessel. God will train you as a vessel. You are going to carry great authority. And therefore, God will train you as a vessel. Not every vessel can contain the glory. God must mold you, break you. He must break you, mold you to contain his glory. Yes, Lord. Pray, 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 pray. I see Jesus seated on the throne. I see his angels moving everywhere. Oh, my heart, Fixing everything. Hallelujah. Upon the throne, I see Jesus seated on the throne. I see his angels moving everywhere. I see the spirit fixing everything. Hallelujah! The Lamb upon the throne, oh, in my world. Emmanuel, um, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, Emmanuel. I see Jesus seated on the throne. I see his angels moving everywhere. I see the spirit fixing many lives. Oh my God. Hallelujah to the Lamb upon the throne. Ibrahim Tara Mako Shalabaha. Oh, me had team in Hekima Halas. A Krobala Hayoro Salaha. A Bakatara Maha. See the spindle moving everywhere. I see the spirit fixing lives again. Ha <laughs> ha. Hallelujah. The Lamb of all the earth. It's fixing life again. It's fixing life again. Kama hatala mako shalabaha. Ebrede ke paha basuke laha. Kama hat ebrede ko shalabaha. Makapani brodo tabaha. Mika pari malosha. O ki paha tara mako shalabaha. Ebrede mantia lava Fixing every land. Oh. Hallelujah. The Lamb upon the throne. I see Jesus. See that all. While he's on the throne. Oh. I see his angels. They are moving everywhere. They are moving up and down. I see the spirit. Fixing lives again. He's fixing things in your life. Allow him. Ha. To the Lamb of all the throne. Ibrahma katu melahatali makosha laha. Eka parita laha la buselehem. Maki prata la makomalas. He krapare malima ho selehem. Imrata la makamala madebre dis. Rapari akatali belenos. La pani prana katu mila halasikala e pretete salaha akapari malatos rakala malote prehedas nele mahatia rapalo sehe ya rimahato kronos vrene mahaus vrene katia la maha ya kanka pane prentali makata anki protati positele ye pete preta pretete e prati ye petre pita de baha bali bahaya Bahaya Salah, Ebre de the Hashi Alaha, Yen de Pina Hosia, Hilipaha, In Napuni Hatahi Baha, Rapa Kali Batai, Rapalo Silehende, 
I crown the labor of Doshalam, and Matipro Nesikaha, Yemehetaraha, Apa Tepro Totositahara, Ebereha Tipro Tata. When you go through the valley of the shadow of death, know that it is just a valley, it is just a shadow, it is just a shadow, it is not death, and you are just going through, you are going through for his name's sake. He puts you on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And the next thing is, yet though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and he says, Do not fear any evil, for he's with you. He has not abandoned you, he's with you. His rod and his staff will comfort you. But right after the shadow, right after the shadow, he will prepare a table. A table before you in the presence of your enemies. A table, a table, a table. Ah, and then he will anoint you. He will anoint your head with oil and your cup will overflow. Your cup will overflow. It's because of the table and the anointing that he takes you through the valley. It is just a valley, just a shadow. The valley of the shadow of death is because he has put you on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. For his name's sake. For his name's sake. At the end, you will dwell in his house forever. You will dwell in his house forever. You will become a pillar in his house. You will move from Bethel to Abertel. You become prophetic. You become a fatherly figure. At the end, God's work will be done through you. Oh my God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Out of my belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living waters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Hey, hey, hey. My belly flow rivers, rivers of living waters. Oh, out of your belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living waters, rivers of living waters, rivers, rivers. The rivers must flow. That is why he's breaking, he's breaking the world. The rivers must flow, rivers of compassion. Rivers of healing, rivers of mercy, rivers of love, rivers of faith, rivers of purity, rivers of the spirit, rivers of wisdom, rivers of wisdom and joy shall flow out of your belly, out of your belly. God is bringing you to a point where your mere presence, your mere presence will release these rivers to flow just by being there rivers will flow because you are pliable because he has done a work in your life because you are pliable Oh,
We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Before time began, what have we done before time began? It is never wisdom can you trust him can you trust his wisdom a time will come you will count God as wise oh a time will come you will count him as wise for hiding you you will count him as wise for taking you through you will count him as wise for stripping you of what you had you count him as wise for separating you. A time will come. You will count God as wise. You will know that he knows what he's doing. You will say thank you to him. You will thank God for the mountains. And you will thank him for the valleys too. Can you trust him? Can you trust him? That known unto God are all his works from the beginning of time. Even before time began. Do you believe that he has set you apart 
and obey you even as a coat of blood in your mother's womb everything that is happening is according to plan according to plan according to divine purpose just trust the Lord just trust him just trust him saying that he's wiping the tear out of somebody's eye he said after that you are going to say Judah your hands will be lifted up in air and you are going to say praise God he said he's wiping the tears wiping the tears of somebody's eye thank you Lord thank you Lord somebody's season has come somebody's season has just come your season has just come your season, you are making a transition. You are making a transition. Your season is another phase for your life. It's another phase, another dimension altogether. It's another era, another epoch of your life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 The Lord says your 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 tears are over. Rockley, the Lord is doing something in your life, and it will result into praise. And God is going to release praise out of your mouth. For God is doing a work. He's doing a work in your life. And God is changing many things in your life and around you. God is taking away your sweat and wiping away your tear. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. I see some people being dressed up and I see all kinds of people attending to you they are putting this on your finger putting this on your face on your head dressing you up and God is saying that there are many things he's doing he's doing on your life and he says I'm going to display them as trophies of my salvation and trophies of my deliverance and trophies of my mercy and trophies of my strength and glory the Lord is putting a helmet on somebody's head. God is putting a helmet. He said, I will make your forehead strong against the enemies. He said, the ones who have been putting you down, who have been defeating you, he said, they can't stand up to you after today. They won't be able to stand up to you again. God is saying they will fall flat on their face before you. He's making your forehead strong against the enemies of your destiny. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. We give you praise. I want us to pray this prayer. Let's pray for Ghana. The nation that we are in. Let's pray for Ghana. Ghana is actually a firstborn. 
Ghana is the first ball. But we need to pray for Ghana because if we don't pray for Ghana, we are going to lose our firstborn status. But let's pray for Ghana. Ghana will take her place as a firstborn of Africa. It's an identity crisis. But Ghana will wake up to consciousness. And Ghana will take her place. The church in Ghana will rise up as one. And the church in Ghana will initiate that kind of change. And Ghana will take a place among the table of on the table of nations as the pride of Africa, as the gateway of Africa. Ghana will lead, will lead many things. God's lamb stand for Africa. It's going to be handed over to Ghana. There's going to arise a mighty move of God from Ghana. From Ghana. You are going to see a change. God is raising psalmists. Psalmists to release prophetic sounds. To break through the atmosphere. And release the prophetic touch of Ghana. Thank you, Lord. Ghana will live and flourish. Ghana will prosper. Ghana will not die. Ghana will stand. The church in Ghana will see light. The church will stand. Authority is coming back to the church. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let all the other names fade away. Let all the other names fade away. Till there's only you. Let all the other names Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. 
Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to pray for you. Kneel down and pray for you. Um, the Lord, I was, I was, you know, I was praying and I was asking the Lord what prayer I should pray for you for something that He did that was of a, a great sacrifice that he, he went through and uh, I wanted to know what prayer I should pray for him I've been praying and then uh, as I stood the Lord just said that first I knew that I want to touch your head he said I, I should confirm the status of Joseph on you that Joseph status that God has made you a Joseph a Joseph and uh, as I lay my hands on you that's 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 what that's what the Lord told me said I should confer a Joseph status on you may God make you as Joseph fruitful may your branches go over and above the walls may God bless you and make you as Joseph make you as Joseph may you be a Sikora to many people May you bring fresh waters to many barren lands. May God enlarge you. And may God make you prophetic as Joseph. May God grant you wealth. May God grant you prosperity. May you become the light of your family. May you take the torch to your family. May you be a savior from Zion. Release your family. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I give praise. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, we give you praise. Mm. I feel a burden lifted off my shoulder. I feel a burden lifted off my shoulder. Uh, God, God, God is God is God is lifting. Is this something that you have you have been seen as something that is insurmountable that you think is impossible and you have not been able to do God says that he's doing it listen he said shout unto this mountain grace grace not war war grace grace God says that the way he's going to do it it will blow your mind he's just going to do it he's just going to do it Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise. You are faithful. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you have said over our lives. Thank you for all that you have done in our lives. Thank you for all that you are going to do. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope you were blessed. For more of this, download Apostle Joseph Minter app on Google Play Store and also available on all podcast platforms, Apple Podcast, Amazon Music, Spotify, and so many more. You can also visit our website, www.torchworldministries.com. Torch World Ministries, we reach, disciple, equip and release. Be blessed.